How's it going guys? We have a past level question for pathology slash histo for step one. This shows up on the NBME exam. So okay, answer choices might sound a little bit weird, but no excuses, this is high yield. So before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like, I really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical, links down below. Find me on Telegram. Links to the Telegram group and channel are down below. And I'll start the clip. So 41 year old man, 12 hour history of abdominal pain. Vitals are within normal limits. Laboratory studies show low calcium, 7.5 milligrams per deciliter should be 8.4 to 10.2. Glucose elevated 180, should be 72 to 99 fasting, 100, 125 fasting is impaired fasting glucose, greater than 126 fasting is diabetes. This by all means could be a random glucose. Okay, any one random glucose above 200 is considered diabetic, but this is definitely higher than what we typically see. Alkaline phosphatase, normal, okay, 50 to 150 is normal range. Here we have 100. Total bilirubin, 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. This is also normal, okay, which should be around 1. And then the direct component, if they give it, should be around 0 0.1 and should be about 10% of total in general. So if you had an elevated bilirubin, let's just say it's 4, and then your direct is 1, and you don't know how to interpret that. Well, as I just fucking said, total bilirubin should be around one. So we're clearly four times the upper limit of normal. And then a one for direct bilirubin would mean we're 25%. So that's an elevated fraction, okay? I'll continue through the questionnaire. Amylase elevated. You don't need to know normal ranges. So we've got this image. You say, no idea what I'm fucking looking at. Okay, well, that's all right. That's all right. Let's just continue through. So which of the following is most likely the explanation for these findings? So let's just go through here. Councilman body formation, wrong fucking answer. Councilman bodies, non-existent yieldness in USMLA. You might occasionally encounter this in a resource. Uh, Golion had mentioned this back in the day. Okay, but this is just an eosinophilic, not eosinophilic, eosinophilic, which means pink, like what we have in this image here, but eosinophilic uh, appearance to necrotic hepatocytes that can be seen with viral hepatitis, yellow fever. Okay. As I just said, non-existent yieldness and USMLE. Wrong fucking answer. Choice B, divalent cation chelation is the correct answer. Okay, so this is acute pancreatitis. We need not have uh, abdominal pain that radiates to the back. Okay, they can just say abdominal pain. They don't have to say the dude's an alcoholic. All right. Now, divalent cation, this refers to calcium chelation of fat, saponification. So in uh, pan acute pancreatitis, we have enzymatic fat necrosis where pancreatic lipases will convert triglycerides into monoisoglycerol, three fatty acids, and the three fatty acids will bind to the calcium. Okay, that's chelation, saponification, soap formation, which is what we see in this image here. Now, you still say, well, no idea what I'm looking at. All right, well, if we have to imagine slash hallucinate something, we could probably say that we've got some circles here right? And then we've got areas where there just appears to be loss of architecture. So these globules are fat, okay? And then it just appears that we have surrounding loss of architecture. It doesn't fucking matter because the rest of the vignette is obvious that this is pancreatitis. You need to know low calcium and high glucose are the two most important poor prognostic indicators for pancreatitis, okay? Now, this goes into step two surgery stuff with Ranson criteria, 48 hours after admission. You don't have to worry about that, even for step two. I just mention it because some students obsess over it. The highest yield point you need to know, all right, straight up, is that if the vignette gives you low calcium or high glucose, those are poor prognostic indicators for pancreatitis. They love giving you low calcium, especially for pancreatitis vignettes. That is a giveaway oftentimes when you have a more vague vignette and you're not sure what's going on, especially the harder 2CK forms, and they give you low calcium and you're like, boom, it's pancreatitis, okay? And the other point is that the degree of elevation of your amylase or lipase isn't related to prognosis, okay? And 2CK questions I've seen for whatever fucking reason will sometimes give elevated amylase without even mentioning lipase, even though lipase is apparently more specific for pancreatitis. So uh, let's just continue through the other answer choice here. I'll give you some high yield points. Islet cell hypertrophy, wrong answer. Obviously, you can have diabetes as a result of beta islet cell destruction. It's not, it would be necrosis, enzymatic fat necrosis as we have here. It's not going to be hypertrophy. Islet cell hypertrophy is seen in acute type 2 diabetes because we have insulin resistance. Okay, so I've seen that as an answer in one of the step one forms. 
Okay, you're just going to give a middle-aged male who is overweight, who they tell you glucose is super fucking elevated, and uh, that's obviously acute type 2 diabetes, and then you just need to know islet cell hypertrophy. Choice D, Mallory Highland, deposition, wrong answer. So you just need to know that Mallory Highland, as weird and as nitpicky and as low yield as this sounds, this shows up on the step one NBME forms. Okay, so all you need to know is that Mallory Highland is deposited in the liver in alcoholic hepatitis. Okay, it's not going to be after one drink, but patients who drink alcohol more consistently, they can get something called Mallory Highland depositing in the liver. Literally nothing else you need to know. You don't, you don't even need to know what it looks like. In this case, wrong fucking answer. Try to see reticular nodular density deposition means absolutely zero, but I can mention that the term reticulonodular in and of itself is high yield for pulmonary fibrosis, restrictive lung disease. So they might, they might give you a patient who's 54, who has a six month history of dry cough. And they say, chest x-ray shows reticulonodular or a reticular pattern. That just means pulmonary fibrosis, okay? So I want you to know reticulonodular pattern on a chest x-ray means uh, restrictive lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis. Don't confuse that with reticulogranular, which is a buzzy term that can show up for neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, NRDS, highland membrane disease. You know the deal to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. I appreciate your time. That's it.